Hi, Nikki. Hi, how you doing? Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to Extra Shot. Um, I am so excited to have you on the podcast today to talk about your life, to talk about your fantastic book, Call You When I Land. Um, I just like, I feel like I've been following you on Instagram. It's that weird thing where I feel like I know you, but I, I don't yet. <laughs> I feel the same way about you. I've been following your book and your journey. So I equally feel the same. <laughs> um, it's been kind of amazing because, you know, I have heard from people like throughout promoting my book, like, oh, we have so many similarities. But as I was reading your book, I was like, oh my God, there's so much to your experience that I also experienced. Um, I just took a bit longer to get there, I think, than you did to have my uh, to have my crisis. So my first question for you is, do you think you've now preempted a midlife crisis because of what you've gone through? Or are you just not going to have one? You just got it out of the way already. Oh gosh, that's a great question. And I hope I have <laughs> because <laughs> I, I truly, you know, calling off the wedding a week before the big day, flipping my life upside down, leaving my job. Like I caused so much drama in my life and that drama really reverberated across my relationships, my family, everything. So I I hope I'm done <laughs> on the yeah. dramatic front. <laughs> at, at one point, my daughter, who is 12, said to me, uh, mom, I think I'm just going to try to figure out what I want before I graduate college. And that way I don't have to have a what if year. I'll just already know what I'm doing. And I was like, I hope that happens for you that you figure everything out by 22. I'm not sure that's going to happen. That is brilliant. I know she was wow. like, I don't want to go through this. I'm just going to figure it all out in advance. So <laughs> out of, out of the mouths of babes, but why don't you uh, introduce call you when I land to the folks that may not have had the good fortune to read it yet, but obviously will after they start, stop listening to this recording. <laughs> <laughs> well, Call You When I Land is a travel memoir that I just published uh, on November 7th. It is a little bit of everything. There is a love story in there. It's a story about being a runaway bride, calling off a wedding a week before the big day. It's a story about chasing a career dream and the ebbs and flows of that. And in my case, it was chasing the dream of becoming a travel editor and writer. It's a story about losing love and finding love about connecting to your identity. In my case, my Colombian heritage. And it's also a story about a murder mystery, which always throws everyone for a loop, <laughs> but really underneath all of it is travel. Everything in this book is sort of told in vignettes and it's all in the context of travel and going to places and finding sort of pieces of the puzzle to the woman I eventually become. And it's a real coming of age journey. And I love that it feels resonant to you. And I hope that other readers also see themselves in the story. I mean, one thing I wanted to hear from you a bit more about on this conversation was your family and their expectations of you and mm -hmm. your career. Um, Tell everybody how, how did your family react when you said that you want to go into travel writing? That's what you want to do. I think my dad might've had a heart attack if I had said that to him, although <laughs> certainly something that I would have loved to explore. Um, how did your family feel about it? And also, you know, those bigger expectations around calling off your wedding, you know, what did your, what did your Colombian family have to say? You know, there was a lot of tension, both of course, around the wedding, but even before the wedding, before that person, my ex-fiance entered my life, there was a lot of tension around my career. I had studied journalism in college and even my declaring a journalism major had caused tension because the fear was very much, this isn't going to pay the bills, which I understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I graduated college and I was pursuing this dream of being a travel writer and a travel editor, I don't think they fully understood what I was going for. And I think their concern was very rightly so. I had student loan bills piling up. I'm living in New York City at this time. I'm on an entry-level salary. It's a steady paycheck, although measly. And the fear was, why would you give up stability for something that is not only not a full-time job, but also not stable. And it wasn't until really my thirties that they finally sort of see, or now see how everything ties together. And I think now that I'm an on-staff travel editor and I'm a senior editor over at Fodor's Travel, 
I think they're like, ah, I get it. Yeah. But at she the time, a steady job like, now it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Now that it's a stable job with a stable paycheck, they get it. But during that time, my gosh, the resistance to it was just like, it was seen as a hobby. It was seen as this thing that like, get it out of your system and time to grow up and you can get a real, a real job. Exactly. And Mm -hmm. I expected that from my parents, Mm -hmm. because of course your parents want you to, to have that stability. But when I met my ex fiance and we were together, I did not expect that from him. And when he was like, you know, when are you going to get this out of your system? When are you going to grow up? When are you going to get over this? Rather than realize that this was a passion of mine that I was very keen on pursuing. It really started to create breaks in that relationship. Mm. How have the people in your life reacted to the book so far? You know, it's actually been overwhelmingly positive, which is so heartwarming. I have to say they were nervous, especially my mom. My mom uh, was really nervous because she was the person that really planned that first wedding and really was in the midst of that drama. I mean, when I was pulling back, when I was avoidant, when I was running away, she was really like holding down the tarps of the tent and like, a hurricane, wow. you know, trying to keep it all together. And it was really painful for her. And, uh, and for me to see what pain I caused her and what anxiety I caused her and especially looking back. And it took us a long time to recover from that choice I had made and the damage that it had caused to our relationship. So I think she was very nervous about this book coming out, about rehashing that drama and about the portrayal of her, but she read it. And she loved it. And she loved how it all tied together in the end. And I think it really was helpful, spoiler alert, that I just got married (laughs) this past September. And that experience was so beautiful. It was, it was everything that was wrong with the first experience was right with this one. And we planned this wedding together side by side. And it was so fun. And we enjoyed every second of it. And when the day came, it was everything that we hoped it would be. And she was so happy and I was so happy and she loves my husband. And she was hoping that we would get married for the past, you know, 10 years. So it was like reading this book now, but being in this place that we're at today, I think made it much more digestible. (laughs) Did she read it? At what stage did she read it? Did she like read it to give you comments? Did you say to her anything you don't like, I'm going to take out, or did you show it to her much later down the line? I showed it to her when it was out in the world and published. <gasps> Ooh, I know, good. I know. I really wanted to keep the book close to my heart. I so I, better that way. I think so too, because, you know, and especially you're an author as well. There's something very pure about when it's just you and your book and your book editor, and you're working on this creative project and you're trying to keep your voice just very pure on the page. Mm -hmm. And when you start having other people giving their comments and their opinions and everything that starts to get a little bit muddied. And also the insecurity starts to fold in. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe that does look that way. And so I really tried to keep it just to me and my book editor. And I shared it with my husband as I was writing it, but for family, it wasn't until it was completely done final, like, all the edits are done. Did I share it with them? Because I wanted them to see the final, final, final version. And that's what they did. So they all read it when the rest of the world got their copies. <laughs> oh my God. One of the most poignant things I found in the story was when you talk about how your definition of failure or how you think about failure changed as a result of your experiences. Um, mm. You know, now years on from the actual experiences that are detailed in the book. Has that changed any further? And have if have you been able to maintain, you know, this sort of renewed attitude about seeing failure, not just as this horrible thing that happens to you, but actually in all the positive ways that you reflect? Yeah, you know, when I talk about failure in the book, it's in relation to Unearth Women. So this magazine that, as you know, I started in 2018, it had this meteoric rise where it went from this idea uh, in the founded in the depths of my unemployment at the time. And then within a year, it was a magazine sold in 800 bookstores around the world. And it had this just 
really exciting, exciting entry Mm -hmm. into the world. And when it slipped through my fingers, which is to say we folded the print magazine after four issues, Mm -hmm. it took me a long time to grapple with what I perceived to be a colossal public failure. Because at that point, it almost felt like calling off that first wedding where I had let everyone down. Right. And that first wedding, it's friends, it's family, it's colleagues, it's it's everybody that had taken time and put money in and made travel plans. And I felt like I had let them down. And then with Unearthed Woman, it was like that tenfold mm-hmm. because now it's all the subscribers and it's it's advertisers and it's the bookstores and it's the distribution company and investor. It's like all of that, it just felt like the pain from the wedding, like just tenfold. And I was, it took me a long time to grapple with that sense of failure that I had failed to sustain this idea, even though it was during a time when magazines that are fully funded were folding. Mm -hmm. Uh, It took me a while to get past that. But what I came to realize is that At the end of the day, and I still stand by it, I think that failure ultimately leads you to where you need to go. It's in those moments that you really learn something about yourself and what you choose to do in that failure is a very defining moment. And you can choose to sit down in the middle of the road and refuse to walk a step further and wallow in that bitterness or disappointment, or you could stand up and brush the dirt off your knees and keep going. And it took me a little while to realize that that was my choice. And for a little while, I was sitting in the middle of that road, just licking my wounds and feeling the colossal disappointment Mm -hmm. of losing this thing that I had poured all my energy and finances and time into. And then I realized that the best thing I could do was just keep moving forward and look at the positive that I did create, which is the case that maybe the magazine didn't exist anymore, but the digital publication did. Maybe the magazine wouldn't be in bookstores, but the book deal we got out of Unearth Woman inspired by Unearth Woman would be. Mm -hmm. So it just was like a reframing and refocusing. And that's something I try to keep going today because I, I think it's very easy to focus on the negative and on what we perceive as failures. And it's hard for some reason to just embrace the good and embrace the positive And I, it's an active, active decision. And it's something I really try to cultivate to this day. I love that so much. So you mentioned that you are newly married. You got married this year. I saw some pics on Instagram. You looked gorgeous. (laughs) The wedding looked beautiful. Thank Um, you. You traveled on your own for many, many years. I mean, now that you've got a companion and I know he's been in your life for a while, has that changed how you travel? Uh, Yes and no. So I continue to travel on my own, but through work. So I, you know, I go on press trips and essentially work trips. And I, last year I was going to Copenhagen and Helsinki and I went to Norway. There was a lot of like Scandinavia, Nordic countries (laughs) last year, but I love that part of my job because it brings me out into the world. It kind of like you know, reminds me of those early days in my travel journey where it was like solo traveling, but now it's a little bit more structured because it is essentially through my job and going out there to get the story. But when I travel personally, I love traveling with my partner. And I noticed that that has changed as well. The way I move through the world, there's a real emphasis on comfort. I don't move through the world the way I did at 22, 23, which is to say, I appreciate having a plan. I appreciate learning about a destination before I get there. I, I don't like having a rigid itinerary, but I like doing research ahead of time. So I know things that I could do when I'm there. And I have such a memory in my twenties of arriving in Uruguay. And I had no idea (laughs) about anything. I didn't know the currency. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know like the town I'm in. I didn't know the history. And looking back, it's like, you know, as spontaneous and wild as that sounds, it's also like, what a missed opportunity Mm -hmm. to not take the time to fully understand where you are and why it matters and what's important and the people there and what they're going through. And I think being a travel editor and journalist today has really cultivated that sense of appreciating a place and culture before you get there. So you can better appreciate your time there. 
it's a curiosity too. I think it, it just, it opens up so much more if you've taken a little bit of time to understand the world that you're entering into, which I think is amazing. Yes, so are you exactly. like the, I have to say that one of my favorite of all my research that I did in prep for this, I think my favorite story that I heard you tell on a podcast was about how you signed up for one of those trips where they don't tell you your destination. Oh, <laughs> they just give you yeah. a packing list and you looked until you found the exact flight time and what flight it was going to be that you were going on. So you could preempt going to your destination. That is so funny. I am honestly, I feel like that is the most telling like story of who I am as a person. And you know, it's funny because I, I feel bad for the company because the company is their whole premise is like surprise travel. And they were so excited that like, I'm writing this story for photos travel. I'm going to go experience their offering. And I just completely <laughs> torpedoed it. And then I had to find a way to write about the fact that I torpedoed it, but I'm so glad I did because that trip. And, uh, you know, I, I went to such crazy lakes because the way it works, like you're, they're sending you on a trip. You don't know where you're going until like you get an envelope and you're not supposed to open the envelope until you're literally standing at the airport, but they send you clues and the clues are like a packing list and a time to be at the airport. And so I'm like looking at this packing list and I'm like, okay, this is clearly not a warm weather destination. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm starting to like, like whittle it down. And then I'm looking at the departure dates and I'm like, all right, LaGuardia at 7 50 AM. And I start I looking it. at like flights leaving LaGuardia and I realized, oh, I'm going to Denver, Colorado. And sure enough, the envelope comes. I don't wait. I rip it open. And here's the thing. I'm really glad I did mm -hmm. because I had like three days and I pulled together a Denver trip and I got us a rental car so we could go to like Rocky Mountain National Park. I got us dinner reservations. We went to this like wild burlesque show in like Denver. We went to like a or an alpaca farm oh, wow. and I managed <laughs> to get all that done in three days. And I'm so glad because I can't imagine being at LaGuardia at five in the morning, opening an envelope for Denver. You get to Denver and you have your hotel and that's it. What the hell do I do? Yeah, exactly. Like, the, like there's no rental car. So I'm like, okay, like that's not arranged and you have no idea where to go. And there's like some certificates for like, oh, like, you know, go get a beer at this brewery if you want. But it's like beyond that, I was like, okay, I'm so glad I spoiled my surprise. And so that became the story and also a real reflection of the fact that I tend to spoil my own surprises. Well, and I mean, I think, and I say this as a fellow type A person, the control element would be really hard for me. <laughs> like, I almost think I should do this as like a personal challenge because I would really <laughs> struggle. I'm such, especially when it comes to travel, I'm such a planner. I'm like such a, and you know, I mean, my, my husband would never plan a surprise trip for me. He just would never do it because no matter what he did, I, I would have thought I would have done something better. <laughs> different. <Yeah. laughs> enjoy the planning process. I find that part of the joy of travel for me is the learning. Oh yeah. I am absolutely like this the idea planner. Of just like raising your hands up, packing a suitcase and opening an envelope and being like, I'm going to X. I don't know. Yeah. It sounds very scary but maybe I should, you try. know, what's so funny. <laughs> and I feel like you'll appreciate this. I literally had no idea that I was a type A person <laughs> until this past year while writing the book. And the reason, and this is why my agent, like she, like on multiple occasions, she was like, okay, I appreciate that you're type A, but you know, don't worry, we'll figure X, Y, Z out. And I'm like, am I type A? Me? And then like my book editor <laughs> would be like, I know you're type A and I love that about you, but we'll, we'll get this done. And like, I kept having like my book team coming to me and being like, I know you're type A. I love that you're type A. So this was the first year in like 36 years of existence that I'm like, oh my God, I'm type A. <laughs> I love it. I do. Um, I felt like so much of my memoir writing process was like therapy. People would be like, so it seems like the protagonist is really mad at her husband in this <laughs> chapter. And, you know, I want to hear more about the underlying conflict. And I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't really realize that, but I guess I better go home and talk to my husband about this because <laughs> they were bringing up all kinds of things. But that's kind of amazing about writing about yourself, isn't it? That you can write things and then other people will read them and tell you things about yourself that you didn't know. Like that you're a isn't type A person. Wild? It's, it's wild. Oh, like 
on the launch event for my book, I was sitting with my conversation partner and one of her questions was, you know, I noticed in the book, you could be really hard on yourself. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I am hard on myself. <laughs> it's like, it's such a surreal experience as I know, you know, not only the, like the creative process of like working with your book editors. And I don't know about like how it was with you, but like when we would talk about my book, like in business meetings, it mm -hmm. was like in a third person sense. Yeah. So like, we'd be like, like, for example, I was talking with uh, my film and TV agent because they're trying to like shop the book around. And they're like, you know, the Nikki character does like X, Y, Z, which could be good for that. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, Nikki, that's, that, that's an that interesting Nikki. scene. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's so weird. And then it goes out in the world. And like all of these book events, having people come up to me and be like, oh, this resonated with me or, oh, I am going through the same thing. Or I also called off my wedding or I want to be a travel writer. And it's just like, oh my gosh, this is so magical because my yeah. story is now your story to do whatever you want with. And what a privilege to have that experience. So at the time we're recording this, your book will have been out not quite a month. Um, mm -hmm. How has your experience promoting it been? Have you enjoyed it? It has been, it has been such a ride. <laughs> you know, it, I really, a lot of wonderful things have come out that I don't think I or my book team expected, you know, because it's, as you know, it's so hard memoir because celebrity memoirs, they make sense. People are invested in these people. And of course they're going to go and run out and buy Britney Spears memoir, but you know, Nikki Vargas, who knows Nikki Vargas. <laughs> so my book, you know, there was, a, there was not a lot of expectation because it's such a tough genre. Mm. And so when it came out and it, you know, it, it was named a staff pick at Apple books and it was a recommended read in good morning America and, and featured out now on the cover of cosmopolitan with an excerpt and it's in real simple and like all this wonderful press, mm. it was just like such a surprise. I think for the entire book team that like, my God, like it's <laughs> finding its readers, but I have to say I am, I consider myself an introvert mm. and of course, as a writer, somebody that just, you know, I love being cozy at home and like writing. And so it, it's very interesting to push myself past my comfort zone and be like, get my book, get my book or come to my event. And like that level of promotion and like, yeah. you really have to sing your praises and you really have to like tap dance for yourself and be like, Hey world, look at me. I did a thing and it's uncomfortable, but it's so necessary. And I remember listening to a podcast with Brene Brown mm -hmm. and she was talking about a book that her very first book, I think that she put out and how it was, it, it just flopped. It was a colossal flop. And she was talking about how she didn't want to sully herself with the, the, the work of promoting it that, you know, she did the thing, she wrote it, right. she washed her hands of it. And she sat back and waited for it to be a bestseller. And when it wasn't that, and she realized something, which is if you're not going to be your biggest cheerleader, how can you expect other people to be? And so I really internalized that for this process. And I pushed myself so far beyond my comfort zone to get my book out there and to travel to other cities where I don't know anyone and be like, hi, I'm Nikki Vargas. Here's my book. And to share it on social media and to really try and push my God. I even joined TikTok, And let me tell you, I did not well, want you, to. You, we were just before we started recording, you were talking about someone we know that's on TikTok now. And I'm like impressed that you're on TikTok because I'm. Oh, my God. Just for the book. I did not want to join TikTok. I'm like, you know what? I'm good. Instagram is already like I'm addicted to it. I'm good. But then I took this like, like course that like my publisher sent us about mm -hmm. how TikTok is like the biggest driver for book sales. And I was like, okay, oh. fine. <laughs> I know. I'm like, all right, here I go. So I it's joined really TikTok. Well, my brother, my brother works for TikTok and I'm like, can't you just TikTok for me? Like, can't you yeah. just, just do it for me? Yeah. I'm like, please, please just do it. <laughs> You're like, I wrote a book. Can't I just relax now? <laughs> 
Now um, I have to do social media and promotion. Well, you got to keep up the hustle because your book is beautiful. It should be in a lot of people's hands. Call You When I Land is out now. You can buy it in all formats. Nikki, I have loved chatting with you. Before I let you go, tell me the inside scoop. What are your hot travel destinations for 2024? Oh my gosh. <laughs> now it's going to be a whole other podcast. <laughs> the pressure is um, on. So many places. I keep going back to the Basque country. I really mm. want to go to the Basque country. So that like area where like, like Northern Spain meets Southern France and they have just beautiful, like not only beautiful scenery, but also like the food there is supposed to be incredible. I really, really, really want to go to the Basque country. I'm also, I'm going next month back to Copenhagen, which I'm very excited about and London, which I haven't been to London in 10 years. And when I went, admittedly, I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm curious to give it another go and see if I can find love for London. <laughs> um, and then the big one is Australia. So I've only been in Sydney airport. And I was dazed and confused because I was somewhere like in a very long haul flight, kind of like time zone yes. jet lag yep. days. And that is the one place where I really, really want to go. And I want to take time to go. So my husband and I are talking about doing a road trip in Australia. And actually we're talking about going with my mom and my stepdad and doing like a little bit of like a family trip. So I think that'd be really, really special. All right. That's fun. Well, put Scotland on your list so you can come up and see me too. You're welcome here. Anyway. Oh, I hear wonderful <laughs> things about Scotland as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Nikki, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me and congratulations to you and my what if year. It has been a joy to watch your book journey as well. Thank you.